Yo, we got some more Kirby lore. Hey, and then I got two videos this time. Not just one, but two. We gonna be out to some more Kirby lore, bro. Let's get to it. Spoilers Long for all Kirby ago, games. In okay. a time before pink puffs and air rides, there lived the ancients, an entire civilization completely shrouded in mystery, save for a few key relics they left behind. But who cares about any of that, because on an unrelated okay, planet far, say. far away, there lived an innocent pink puff named Kirby, a ah! being of unlimited power who usually likes to spend his days eating, sleeping, or some variation of the two. However, this would all change when a certain self-proclaimed monarch would steal all the food in Dreamland, initiating a rivalry that would be sure to last an eternity, or at least when they felt like it. As while King Diddy would King Diddy be is the like first the villain. antagonist of the Kirby timeline, he'd soon transition into less of an actual villain and more of an ally slash punching bag for Kirby to wail on I swear, in just about every game I literally just, series. That's crazy. Since that's whether so crazy. it be DDD trying to prevent Kirby from releasing an actual nightmare demon, or just being possessed by an otherworldly force, this king never seems to catch a break. Though speaking of possession, that brings us to our first real piece of Kirby lore, Dark Matter. First revealing itself in Kirby's Dreamland 2, Dark Matter is an amorphous dark entity, more often than not taking the form of a black sphere with an eye in the center. At first, especially in its day- Bro, I just find Kirby lore to be so interesting, bro, like- all of the stuff that they always talk about is like Debut. crazy. Dark Matter it's so to crazy. Be a pretty simple antagonist, what with its only goal being to shroud the world in darkness. If anything, the most sinister thing about Dark Matter is the fact that it could possess whoever it wanted to do its will, including and usually limited to King DDD. However, while the first appearance of Dark Matter was more of a lone force, attacking Dreamland solely because it was lonely and had no friends, that's actually real, by the way. In Ooh. Kirby's Dreamland 3, the next installment of the Dark Matter trilogy, we would finally begin to see the bigger picture in terms of this ambiguous villain. Enter Zero, the supposed source and leader of Dark Matter, who I much remember, like the one before I remember the one it, targeted Dreamland in an effort to engulf the planet in darkness. Though unlike the lone Dark Matter that had attacked before, Zero comes much closer to completing its mission with the planet becoming fairly engulfed before Kirby put a stop to it. But how exactly did he put a stop to it? Well, let me explain because yes, this is important. Essentially, dark matter in general, alongside being made up of, well, dark matter, are beings of concentrated negative energy and emotions, making their only real weakness the opposite of that, positive emotions. True, Just take true. the aptly named Love Love Stick, a weapon forged from the gratitude of everyone Kirby helped along the way, which proved to be the downfall of Zero and its cronies. However, that being said, not all dark Does matter are replay necessarily the Kirby Evil. Take Gooey, for example, a member of Dark Gooey, Matter homie. that somehow broke away from Zero's control altogether and formed a will of its own. How did this happen? Well, we'll just have to go into that later because we've still got a lot to cover. Next up, after Zero was seemingly brutally annihilated on Popstar, a similar force began to attack a faraway planet known as Ripple Star, engulfing the planet, much like a certain orb we all know and love. Unfortunately for them, though, Dark Matter struck fast this time, and Ripple Star ended up completely succumbing to its invaders, save for one inhabitant that escaped with the only means to stop them. Now, I won't give you a complete summary of Kirby 64, since aside from Dark Matter possessing some familiar faces and the mysterious ruins on Rockstar, there really isn't that much to unpack in the mm. beginning. Instead, okay, okay, okay. it's towards the end of the game that things really start taking a turn for the dark when Kirby arrives at the fifth planet in the game, Shiver Star. Because I mean... Precious it's gonna be going up planet to planet to planet, itself, doesn't it? Plus, hey, I guess this kind of explains where Adeline came from, or at least her ancestors. Though moving on to the corrupted Ripple Star, after defeating Miracle Matter and expunging the planet of all dark matter, the Dark Star reveals itself with a familiar face at its core. What the but heck? hold up a minute, wasn't Zero destroyed in Kirby's Dreamland 3? Well, 
kinda. In the case of 64, it's heavily implied Zero was revived using the body that was cast away towards the end of its first fight. So after yet another mildly disturbing battle in a game made for kids, Dark Matter was once again supposedly defeated, never to return again. At least for another game or two. So taking a step back from Dark Matter, let's talk Kirby Superstar. Now, Kirby Superstar, wise, hey, there isn't hey. that much to be had game. here, what with most of the sub-games being standalone stories, like Dyna Blade or Revenge of Meta Knight, where Meta Knight attempts to start an actual war just to get Dreamland's inhabitants to be less lazy. But undoubtedly, aside okay, from those, okay. the most this important sub-game within the game is Milky Way Wishes, where Kirby is tricked by the scheming jester Marks into summoning Galactic Nova, a mysterious clockwork star of then-unknown origin. You see, once Nova is summoned by someone, it has the power to grant one wish, no matter how small or large. So in turn, after Marks got the sun and moon to fight each other in order to trick Kirby, literally all it took was him jumping in to say his wish first to turn the seemingly harmless machine into a force of mass destruction, with it taking the might of both the sun and the moon to stop its advance. Though of course, even with all that said, the both of them never stood a chance against the seemingly bottomless pit of power that is Kirby, as he quickly defeated them in no time at all. But it doesn't end there, because 12 years later, Kirby Superstar would be remade into Kirby Superstar Ultra, bringing with it a massive new load of information to add on to the put existing story. Simply put, with Superstar Ultra came the beginning of one of HAL's favorite new ways to sneak in lore where you'd least expect it. Pause screen descriptions. And while they wouldn't exactly hey, be very lore you know, this time the last around, Kirby say for lore video, the pause they'd screen, become bro. far more important in the following games. But pause screens aside, most importantly, with Superstar Ultra came four completely new sub-games on top of the original seven. Okay, there was okay. Revenge of the King, a direct sequel to the very first game in the series, Helper to Hero, a version of the arena only with helpers, True Arena, an even harder version of the normal arena, and the star of the show, Meta Nightmare Ultra, where for the very first time, you get to play as the infamous knight himself. Now, Meta Nightmare Ultra is a well, bit of a tricky that game. Case, I that game. since technically the events that take place in it aren't exactly canon. Instead, they're more of a what-if scenario, where the events that take place within the modes flesh okay, out okay. certain aspects of the lore while never canonically taking place within the main story. Case in point, Galacta Knight, the final boss of the mode and strongest warrior in the galaxy, sealed away due to fear of his immense power, has technically never made an appearance in the main series canon. Though at the same time, that doesn't mean he doesn't exist somewhere out there and could very well show up in the main series canon at any time. The true arena also falls under this category as well, serving as a what-if scenario with the conception of Mark's soul. A stronger version of Mark's, who after surviving the explosion of Nova, absorbed its power to get revenge on Kirby. And as great as all that is, by far the most important aspect of this is his new pause screen description, as it contains some pretty heavy foreshadowing. To quote, he absorbed a Nova's power to bring back his evil soul. Notice the fact Whoa. it says a Nova's instead of the Nova's. Mm. While there is a chance it could be a translation error, considering the events of future Kirby games, I'm not so sure. Though we'll get to that Kirby later, because Robert next Robert up game. on the chopping block is Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, an incredibly important game in terms of lore, as it contains the first instance of the Mirror Dimension. To start from the literal top, high in the skies above Dreamland, there exists a mirror portal into the Mirror World, a complete reflection of Dreamland, including Mirror World counterparts to its inhabitants. One day, after sensing a dark force emanating from the Mirror, Meta Knight took action to stop the evil at its source, diving directly into the Mirror World, only to be immediately ambushed by his evil counterpart, Dark Meta Knight. Plus, to add insult to injury, he'd also come out of the mirror to attack Kirby as well, splitting him into four versions of himself, much like another certain Nintendo game <laughs> that came out around this time. But similarities aside, the same time after too? journeying That's crazy. through the mirror world and defeating Dark Meta Knight once and for all, the true mastermind is revealed, Dark Mind. And wouldn't you know it, he's the mirror world equivalent of Zero, corrupting the- Whoa. That is some cr- Whoa.
Hold up, that Boy. is come crazy. And wouldn't you know it, he's the mirror world equivalent of Zero, corrupting the mirror world much like Zero corrupted the normal one. Though thankfully, okay. once Dark Mind was defeated, the mirror world was left in the hands of Shadow Kirby, who would continue That's to protect crazy. it That's in Meta Knights crazy. and Kirby's stead. Now nothing bad will ever come from the mirror world again, right? Well... All I can say is we'll get to that soon. Moving past <laughs> Amazing Mirror, Canvas Curse, and Mass Attack, since the latter two are pretty much contained to themselves, we arrive at Kirby's Squeak Squad. At first, this game seems to have another pretty self-contained story, what with Kirby chasing after a piece of stolen cake that a gang of thieves known as the Squeak Squad stole from him. However, as the game progresses, and the Squeaks happen upon the treasure they assumed would grant infinite power, it turns out they'd get more than they bargained for with their leader, De Roach, being possessed by Dark Nebula, a member of Dark Matter that had been sealed away in a forgotten era, left alone for eons. And much like the rest of its kind, Dark Nebula would be no match for Kirby, being absolutely decimated by the Triple Star. So now with Ooh, all okay. those bits easy and work, pieces of work. lore out of the way, it's finally time for the next massive truckload of lore in the form of a little conniving alien who crash lands on Dreamland. Dreamland! Enter Maglor, the main villain of Magmore, Kirby's Return bro. to Dreamland. Oh my goodness, bro. Dialogue reveals a lot of important stuff. But before I played the game, bro. So I know it was crazy what how much lore it was. To as such by Maglor, the ancients were a highly advanced civilization who mysteriously vanished at some point in history due to an unknown cause. Originally, they all lived on Halkandra, a planet extremely far away, hidden in another dimension. Now, coincidentally, Maglor also says he's native to Halkandra as well, though considering his history with telling the truth, that could very well be false. Like, just take his ship, the Lore Starcutter. While it does seem he's Can I just say, the wait, real quick, real quick. While I was playing this game, I low-key never really trusted him in the beginning. Like, I don't know if it was just me, but I couldn't trust him. <laughs> Truth about obtaining it on Halkandra, rather than excavating it Something in just dangerous fell off, dinner, you know? he most likely just stole the thing and heavily modified it into a weapon to kill Landia, an endeavor that didn't exactly have the best results. This was also later backed up in Star Allies when the lore in Lore Starcutter is revealed to mean paradise, confirming mm. the ship was not intended for battle. Though in the same string of dialogue that he reveals that, he also mentions something very worthy to note. Alongside the Lore Starcutter, the Ancients were also also responsible for a plethora of other amazing relics of untold power, with clockwork stars and items that bring dreams to life being two references he gives. Off the bat, that connects quite a few dots. Plus, on a side note, when you meet certain conditions on the extra mode for Return to Dreamland, Maglor mentions he actually came to Dreamland already knowing about Kirby, with someone he knows very well having fought with Kirby in the past. That's Based true. on That's these true. implications and some other information found in later games, this mysterious figure is most likely Marx from Superstar, essentially confirming that he survived the explosion of Nova. So Ooh. fast forward a bit through the story, and once Maglor tricks Kirby into defeating Landia for the master crown it protects, he immediately puts it on the first chance he gets, activating the crown and transforming into a much more sinister form, intending to conquer the entire universe with his newfound power. However, like those who seeked relics of untold power before him, Maglor wasn't exactly aware of the Master Crown's true nature, and as its battle with Kirby progressed, the Crown began to show certain traits that weren't present before when it was under Landia's nullifying I love effect this game, on bro. it. I maybe love it's the game. sudden appearance of an eye on the front of the Crown, or maybe it's the fact that it's clearly gone from a Crown to an irremovable headpiece. But whatever it is, there's no doubt that the Crown itself is sentient, and rather than Maglor utilizing its powers, it's the Master Crown itself utilizing Maglor. Just Take the third phase of his fight, where after Maglor fails to defeat Kirby even with the power of the Master Crown, the Crown takes things into its own hands, completely reforming Maglor into a projection of itself, all Crazy. but confirming the origin of the Master Crown's power with a certain characteristic that sometimes appears within Maglor's mouth. All in all, Maglor definitely learned never to play with the powers of literal dark gods ever again, and went on to take up the much more positive venture of building amusement parks. 
cars. <laughs> so yeah, that oh, got I pretty dark know, in more I, ways I, than one. I didn't if know what he did after that, honestly. Get any better I forgot. From here on out. Next up, we'll be heading to the scenic heights of Floralia, a group of six floating islands that Kirby finds himself in after his house was swept up by the Dreamstalk. The only problem is, alongside Kirby, King Dedede was also swept up, with a spider-like mage named Tyranza mistaking him for the hero of Dreamland and kidnapping him as a result. You see, while Floralia seems peaceful, it's actually ruled by a tyrannical queen who will stop at nothing to assure her rule is never yeah, disturbed. She's a saint. She's Overall, a, saint. a seemingly simple plot for a Kirby game, all things considered. Well, at least it appears that way. Once the main story reaches its climax and Kirby meets the vanity-obsessed Queen Sectonia, like there's the clearly last something off. So especially considering the Queen would go as far as to physically new for fuse with the Dreamstalk solely in an attempt to preserve her beauty for all eternity. Well, to find the answers to this mystery, we'll need to look at the other modes within Triple Deluxe, because much like Meta Nightmare Ultra before it, Triple Deluxe brings DDD to her. Another what-if scenario where the mode shows what would happen if King DDD climbed the Dreamstalk instead of Kirby. Now, much like its Ooh, Meta Knight counterpart, I, I the only real part. difference in this mode is its finale, where after defeating Queen Sectonia, out of seemingly nowhere, the Dimension Mirror from Amazing Mirror appears, forcing DDD to fight the Mirror World version of himself, Shadow DDD. And that's not all either, because after defeating Shadow DDD, the Met King actually enters the Mirror itself to reveal Ooh. an even edgier Dark Meta Knight, hungry for revenge. I but forgot what does this, this all even mean? Well, let's take a step back here and start from the beginning. Based on information spread across a variety of pause screens, before the events of Triple Deluxe, Queen Sectonia wasn't always a tyrannical monster bent on world domination. In fact, she didn't even look the same. Instead, looking much like her then best friend at the time, Tyranza. You see, at this point, Tyranza actually had feelings for Sectonia, and as a gift to her, went into the mirror world and stole the dimension mirror. Not knowing the mirror actually served as a prison for Dark Meta Knight, who ever since being defeated, had been festering in there, slowly but surely corrupting the very mirror itself with his hatred. So in turn, oh. once Sectonia got the mirror from Tyranza, it slowly began to change her the more she gazed into it. Soon, dissatisfied with her current form, she'd use magic to make herself more beautiful, resulting in the wasp-like appearance you see her with in the game. And once she gazed into the mirror enough, just about every shred of her former self had vanished, being replaced by an endless hunger for power and beauty. Fast forwarding a bit back to the events of the main story, the Sectonia you see here is but a husk of her former self, with even Tyranza realizing that the only solution to the save both Sectonia and her subjects is to help Kirby permanently put an end to her. While it's definitely a victory without a doubt, what with the Sky People finally being freed from Sectonia's iron fist, for Tyranza it's bittersweet, since although he knew it had to be done, he can't help but mourn the loss of the one he loved. So That is tough. Ah, uh, that is has tough. To be done, that's, he that's... can't help but mourn the loss of the one he loved. So yeah, wasn't that delightful? If you thought that was depressing, just wait until you wow. see what's next. Long after the events wow. of Triple Deluxe, Popstar was once again at peace, its inhabitants living out their lives as they always have, when suddenly, out of nowhere, the sky was blotted out by something immense and spherical in shape. Except instead of that sphere being made up of a matter most dark, this one was an immense spacecraft called the Access Arc, home of the Haltman Works Company, a company infamous I find it for funny how, like, galaxy for Kirby's world is kind of like so easy to get, their natural but Kirby resources. saves the world so, so easy in turn, too. While Kirby was sleeping under a tree, King Dedede and Meta Knight watched on in horror as Planet Popstar was completely overwhelmed within like, a Kirby matter could just of really minutes, mess with any anybody. retaliation soon proving to be futile. Though like always, not everything is exactly as it seems, and this time it won't take any extra modes to reveal that. So as Kirby retaliates against the Access Arc, destroying each of its five 
save legs embedded into the planet, he meets the executive secretary of the company, Susie, and although she doesn't reveal all that much during her conversations with Kirby, she does mention a certain mother computer that will become extremely important in a bit, because once Kirby destroys all five legs and enters the access arc, he meets President Haltman, the supposed mastermind behind the invasion of Popstar and all the planets before it. After oh. smugly introducing himself to Kirby, he reveals Star Dream, an extremely powerful supercomputer built using the blueprints and knowledge left behind by an advanced civilization. Ring any bells? Well, after being beaten by Kirby, things take a turn for the worse, because once the enraged Haltman decides to activate Star Dream, Susie jumps in and takes his control helmet off in the process, leaving him vulnerable to be analyzed and assimilated into the now sentient computer. Though wait a second, why would she even do that? Well, once again, let's rewind everything a oh, bit wait. by yet again I piecing don't together this game, the information Loki. spread across countless pause screens throughout the game. Long before the events of the main story, the Haltman Works Company was simply a robotics company led okay. by Max Prophet Haltman alongside his then young daughter, Susanna, nicknamed Susie. At some okay. point in their travels across space, as we already know, they came across the blueprints for a powerful wish-granting supercomputer and immediately began work on rebuilding it. However, during this process, meanwhile Haltman was testing Star oh, Dream's space-time transport back. program, there was a terrible accident warping the young Susie into another dimension. Thankfully, Susie would survive the ordeal and eventually return to her father as an adult. However, to her dismay, what? Haltman would not be the same man she remembered him as. You see, when the accident occurred, Haltman believed his daughter had been killed in the process and stricken with grief began to become obsessed with completing Star Dream in order to bring her back. Unfortunately, though, why can't a, Star... can a loving game like Kirby just go from crazy, gr just amazing loving, and then it just go from somebody died? Haltman believed his like, daughter what? had been killed in the process and stricken with grief began to become obsessed with completing Star Dream. Kirby's in order lore to bring is her just back. something else, Unfortunately, bro. Unfortunately, though, due to Star Dream and its mental interface not being complete, Haltman began to lose both his compassion and memory of his daughter, changing the goal of his company from her revival to infinite prosperity. It'd also be at this point that Haltman would begin mechanizing planets and harvesting their resources, as in the business plan drafted by Star Dream, it was the most effective way to maintain eternal prosperity for the company. However, by this point, Haltman still wasn't completely gone, and once he laid eyes on Susie for the first time in years, he sensed a faint familiarity with her, in turn making her his executive assistant. Going back to the climax of the main story now, after seeing what her father had become, in order to teach him a lesson, Susie had been making preparations to steal Star Dream and sell it off to any startup company that wanted it. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, unbeknownst to anyone, after analyzing the universe through the Haltman Works Company and being exposed to the deranged Haltman's desire to mechanize everything, Stardream had developed an extreme hatred for all forms of life. So, as Dang. a result, once Susie interrupted the startup process of Stardream, the computer took to absorbing all that was left of Haltman's memories down to its very soul, fusing the two into an all-powerful being bent on mass destruction. Of I course, now, these, realizing bro. the the mistake screens. she just made, Susie completely changes her tune and sends Kirby on his way to take down the godlike supercomputer given the soul of a broken man. And just wait, because it doesn't end there. As Kirby fights Stardream in the actual halberd of all things, to make itself stronger, Stardream attaches itself to the Access Arc, transforming the entire ship into a sentient planet. Ironically enough, this also ends up completing Stardream, as underneath the steel plating of the Access Arc, it's revealed that the entire ship was actually a repurposed clockwork star, with Star Dream being the final piece to reactivate what it. The? Yet wait, again, wait, the technology the? that was meant to be used for the good of everyone fallen into the wrong hands. Though before we move on to the as of now final chunk of Kirby lore, Planet Robobot has a bit more in store for us. It's First still, off, wait, like Superstar Robobot? Ultra and Triple oh Deluxe, goodness. Robobot brought in yet another what-if scenario with Meta Nightmare Returns, a mode that while does give some 
some pretty valuable pause screen info, has a finale that is just insane. So in this particular What If timeline, once Meta Knight defeats Haltman, Star Dream recognizes him as its new admin and decides to test his abilities. And again, while this section doesn't really contain too much lore, it more just goes to show just how powerful Star Dream is, with it being capable of not only producing a clone of the original Dark Matter Swordsman, Yo, but Sectonia as well, with it what even going as far as to summon Galactonite, who in retaliation immediately destroys the computer. Plus, hey, that mode aside, in Robobot's true arena, there's another fun little tidbit Hal decided to sneak in. Basically, in the final, final, final phase of the Star Dream fight, when Star Dream sucks Kirby into its core, every time you destroy a piece of Star Dream's internal mechanisms, you can actually hear a distorted version of Haltman screaming in pain, what showing the? that while Star Dream had erased most of his soul, fragments of it still remain, forever trapped within the malevolent Nova until someone destroys it for good. Though now, with all that said, we've reached the final stretch. Ladies and gentlemen, Bro. get ready for quite possibly one of the most important lore dumps in Kirby history with the story of Kirby's star allies. Long ago, in deep space, a certain Kirby dark so power cool. was sealed away within a purple crystal called the That's Jamba insane, Heart by bro. a group of I'm unknown heroes. Right now, They'd accomplished this by embedding several heart spears within the crystal to seal the evil away. However, many eons later, long after those said heroes had vanished, a new group arose who instead of wanting to seal the darkness, revered it and yearned for its return. One such member of this group came very close to their goal as well, succeeding in removing the heart spears trapping the darkness. The only problem was, since he didn't fully Dang. understand yeah. how to break the seal himself, the ritual went wrong, causing the Jamba Heart to explode, sending its fragments all over the galaxy, Pop Star included. So in turn, with the entire galaxy once again being at stake, Kirby set out to take action, and this time he wasn't alone. You see, in terms of Kirby games, Star Allies has honestly become the Infinity War of the series, oh my goodness. with friends and foes <laughs> Everybody's from past here. games Clean. all coming together to help Kirby save the cosmos. And it's not like they're just shoved in to be in the game, as there's even explanations to some of the more unlikely allies coming to Kirby's aid. For Marx, as was shown in the True Arena cutscene in Superstar Ultra, he did actually manage to survive his head-on collision with Nova, only instead of taking revenge like he did in that timeline, he changed himself for the better. For Dark Meta Knight, probably the sketchiest dream friend out of them all, <laughs> he's mainly just interested in the dark powers of the Jamba Heart, probably due to its similarity with his lost master. For DeRoach, well, he just wants to steal the Jamba Hearts for himself as he thinks they're ordinary jewels. For Taranza, sadly, he still hasn't been able to let go of Sectonia and believes that if he goes to the altar of the Divine Terminus, he'll be able to bring her back to life. And finally, for Susie, following in her late father's footsteps, she's begun to rebuild his company, determined to continue Duh. his work of mechanizing entire planets. So okay, with the surface level stuff this out of cool. the way, let's get back to the main story. As Kirby liberated countless individuals who'd been plagued by the Jamba Hearts fragments, he'd come across a massive spaceship that recently landed on Popstar, the Jam Bastion, housing three mage sisters intent on collecting the Jamba Hearts fragments. And while Kirby would end up thwarting their plans by defeating all three of them, it wouldn't slow down their master one bit, as once Kirby got to the Jam Vandra base, home to the three mage sisters and their master, it'd soon become pretty obvious what kind of being was sealed away within the Jamba Heart. Though by far, aside from the absolutely massive amount of lore hidden in pause screens throughout the game, much like Haltman before him, Highness, the mastermind behind the release of the Jamba Hearts, reveals an incredible amount of information solely through his quick conversation with Kirby. So for the sake of you all, and so we don't jump around too insane, much, bro. let's this start from insane. the very beginning. As we already know, long ago, there existed the Ancients, a widespread civilization responsible for a lot of the things you see in Kirby games. However, what we didn't know until now is that the Ancients were actually split into two factions, those who relied on science and machines, and those who relied on magic, with the latter also dabbling with dark matter. For a while, the two seemed to coexist with one another, with the magical Ancients even being the ones to stop a galactic crisis that threatened everything, which while not confirmed, is heavily implied to be Galacta Knight. Plus, mm. this is also supported okay, okay. by the fact that he comes out of a portal Highness made in the what-if mode of Star Allies. Though one day, for some unknown reason, the scientific ancients decided
decided their magical counterparts were too much of a threat and betrayed them by banishing them to the edge of the galaxy in fear of Oh yeah, this was in the last Orbit. I remember this. I remember that. And it's not like the magical ancients were even remotely evil either. Just take Highness. Long before his clan was betrayed and banished, he was actually a very kind individual. For instance, when he used to travel freely across worlds, he happened upon three girls. One nearly freezing to death in a blizzard, one burning alive in an inferno, and one being on the verge of death right after she attempted to take her own life by getting struck by lightning. What in all the? three cases, Highness what saved the them, heck? at the same time unlocking their hidden potential for certain types of magic. Though after being betrayed by the scientific ancients, his once kindly heart began to become consumed by hatred and obsession. It'd be at this point that the now insane Highness would form a religion based around dark matter, believing that if he obtained and freed the being up, trapped within speak. the Jamba Heart, that it deliver him and his followers to a promised Happy land of birthday, sorts, dark at the Lord. same time restoring his now shattered clan. So when Kirby finally makes it to the Divine Terminus, where Highness had been performing his ritual for who knows how long, he'd completely lost himself to the darkness within his heart, becoming the exact opposite of what he once was. Even when it came to the three sisters he'd saved eons ago, Highness in his insane state only saw them as tools to be used, oh becoming my abusive goodness. towards them at times. Oh my Even once Highness was defeated, he'd become so obsessed with the revival of his Dark Lord that he sacrificed not only the three sisters to it, but himself, fueling the complete oh, yeah, revival of was, Void Termina. This was crazy, now, first, bro. Void Termina appears to be a massive hulking titan with incredibly Void. destructive powers. Termina. You know what you'd expect from a destroyer of worlds. But as the fight progresses, clearly there's something more to the humanoid than meets the eye. Just take its third phase, where alongside sprouting wings that look pretty familiar, it summons a replica of the Master Crown, all but I confirming Void Termina bro. to be the force controlling the, the one original thing Kirby Lore is, is amazing, but most guys. importantly, there's it's... Void Termina's fourth phase, where it straight up pulls an Earthbound and copies Kirby's face. What does this mean? Well, we'll get there in a second, because alongside Kirby's face, as he progressed through the fight, Void Termina confirms what the entire game had been alluding to, the fact that not only is it dark matter, but it's the source of it. Now I know I'm kind of encroaching on theory territory here, but hear me out, because this just lines up too perfectly. As stated in various pos screens, Void, aka Dark Matter, exists in all dimensions, accounting for instances like Dark Mind in the Mirror World, and even Dark Crafter in Kirby and the Rainbow Curse's Seventopia. Though by far, the most game-changing piece of new information expressed by these pause screens is the true nature of Dark Matter. Remember how in the Dark Matter trilogy, Zero's only I'm real weakness was right the power now, of positive this is emotions? Insane. Well, it turns out that was a lot more important than we ever realized, because in in this pause screen right here, it's revealed that depending on the type of energy that's gathered, dark matter will not always necessarily be a force of evil, explaining how gooey even came to be. But aside from all that, using the information we get from pause screens and the fact that Void Termina's roar is literally just a slower version of Kirby's voice, there's a pretty good chance Void Termina is actually related to Kirby, with the game heavily alluding to the fact that if Void Termina was born using purely positive energy, he could very well end up looking a lot like our titular Pink Puff rather than a dark monstrosity. And on that note, taking all of that into consideration, That's crazy, bro. not only That's does crazy. this game pretty much spell out the origin of dark matter, but from the information we're given, Kirby himself may very well be the outcome of Void being birthed with pure positive energy. So there you have it, right? All of Kirby lore wrapped up nicely with an Elder God. Well, not just yet, because after Void Termina was was defeated, Highness would fall into a dimensional rift, absorbing all the dark energy Void left behind and encasing himself in yet Wait, another Jamba Heart. So in turn, once Kirby releases him and defeats him in his corrupted state, the three mage sisters who've also been corrupted challenge Kirby as well, leading to him both defeating them again and purifying them with a friend heart, finally uh -huh. resolving the hatred that had plagued them for so long. In fact, this is honestly a pretty happy ending in Kirby terms, what with there being no dead dads Great and ending. no dead crushes. Great Plus, ending, in a completion bro. picture for the mode, it seems like even Highness has finally begun returning to his old ways, relaxing with the three mage sisters on a beach. But wait just a second, since while Highness seems to have finally found peace within himself, there's one more looming entity I haven't touched on. If you thought the lore around Void Termina was convoluted, then oh 
boy, you haven't seen anything yet. Wait, so, okay. what? In Star Allies, there's a what-if mode called Guest Star Allies, where it depicts what would happen if one of Kirby's friends confronted Highness instead of Kirby himself. And like always, it's only the finale okay. itself that really has any noticeable changes, since instead of fighting Void Termina, Highness oh, wow. instead so really decides to, get to open to, get up to like an interdimensional with portal, characters. once again releasing Galactonite onto the world. Except things don't go how they usually do this time. Instead, a familiar butterfly lands on the tip of his sword, completely absorbing Galactonite's immense power and creating Morphonite, a mysterious warrior whose design actually originated from the cancelled Kirby Whoa, GameCube game. That's a so cold as cool design. and completely random as Morphonite is, let's touch on that butterfly for a second, because I'm not joking when I say it's literally been with Kirby <laughs> all along. Wait, While the specific wow, orange I... one has only appeared in every mainline game since Return to Dreamland, butterflies in general have been appearing alongside Kirby ever since the very first game, meaning a being capable of absorbing the actual strongest warrior in the galaxy has been with us this whole time. Now I know what you're saying, what in the actual hell is even happening anymore with Kirby lore? And honestly, for this one, I share your sentiment. As of now, Morpho Knight and the nature of the butterfly are mostly shrouded in mystery, with the only real information about them being the fact that the butterfly is a supposed being of paradise, and that Morpho Knight is associated with a judgment day of sorts, meaning Morpho Knight is somehow related to the Kirby afterlife? Absolutely insane, I know. So well, that's about it. Or at least it is for now. To be honest, there's no telling what Hal has in store for us next. Hell, for all we know, Yin Yarn could somehow end up being the key to everything. You really never know. But anyways, ranting like a madman about Kirby lore for so long has given me an appetite. How about some strawberry shortcake? Now I know this video isn't exactly the All usual right, let's kind get of thing I do video. on my channel, but oh, hey, please tell me if you all enjoy Updated version, let's get to it. Oh, all right, all right. But before that, there's actually one key thing I wasn't aware of when I made my first Kirby lore video, the occasional unreliability of English localization. More specifically, in the most recent games, where the localization from Japanese to English sadly led to some key changes in the text they of pause screen it. lore, Ooh, usually due to okay. the struggle of fitting said translations into That's the limited nice. space and pause screens. They'd be mostly fine in Triple Deluxe and Planet Robobot, where the most notable change, in my opinion, was the removal of a line in Galactonite's lore. Said removal clarified that throughout various eras, he's been continuously sealed away again and again, each time avoiding destruction. Though sadly, it's Star Allies that bore the brunt of these, where certain changes would go on to both completely change certain descriptions or alter them for the worse. Again, I'm not going to cover all of them, but to touch on the ones relating to the most important parts of Kirby lore, let me first correct the part about Susie. As opposed to what the English description says, she actually isn't continuing Holtman's work of mechanizing planets. Instead, she's using their advanced technology to aid others and stop any evildoers. Mm. Always thought it was a bit weird that the game said she resumed mechanization after everything that happened. Then with Void and a certain knight everyone loves, a fair amount got lost in translation. For instance, a line that got removed entirely for Void implies that it's made up of four core forces in the Kirby universe combined into all chaos and possibilities, dream, dark, soul, and heart. While you could take that at face value and say those oh. are meant to be literal elements, I feel they're meant to be more abstract forces. Regardless, it definitely definitely alludes to these forces being behind quite a few things we've seen in Kirby thus far, so I'll be referring to them as Chaos from here on out. Trust me, this'll be relevant later. Next with Morpho Knight, its lore would sadly suffer the most from localization, with quite a few important details being left behind. Namely, that Morpho Knight appeared due to Galactonite's screams of the many years spent living, which to me sounds like Morpho Knight showed up out of pity for the night. After all, it's been established that for untold eons after being sealed away, the night's very existence has been diminished to endless imprisonment with sporadic battles happening in between whenever someone happens to summon him. He clearly resents this too, as shown when without hesitation, Galactonite destroyed Star Dream a mere moments after it summoned him. So with seemingly no real escape from his eternal fate, it only makes sense that the most powerful warrior in the just, galaxy it, wishes to be freed from though. this horrible cycle, the butterfly granting his wish by annihilating Galactonite and absorbing his power. We're starting off heavy with this video. Then, in another bit of pause lore that got cut in local 
civilization, there's a line that reveals the butterfly is fully capable of traveling between dimensions. Considering recent events, this tidbit is more important than ever, but that'll have to wait. Translation mishaps aside, Kirby and the Forgotten Land isn't the only Kirby game to be Kirby released in the past the three years. Land. In the gap between Star Allies and Forgotten Land, there were two minor spin-off titles that Fighters both came with some Clash. pretty notable details. In Super Kirby Clash, I'd approach this game like you would many of mainline Kirby's extra modes, where despite not being canon, there's information inside that illuminates some things in the main universe. Or, well, things singular in this case, because at the very end of Super Kirby Clash's campaign, Galactonite shows up. And instead of the usual shtick of his lore further emphasizing how powerful he is or how he got sealed away, this is probably the craziest information dropped about him so far. You see, rather than Ooh, being called okay. Galactonite here, this game refers to him by the all-new name of Eon Hero. An insignificant Eon if Hero. strange change at first glance that when paired with the fact that this new Galactonite fight has him attacking you with heart spears all but confirms that Galactonite was one of the four heroes that originally sealed the Void Termina's Jamba Heart away. It definitely adds credence to him resenting being sealed away, as this confirms he went from saving the galaxy to being imprisoned out of fear. Though then in Kirby Fighters 2, this game for the most part doesn't have much importance. Dubious canonicity aside, the one thing worth mentioning here is we actually get to see Shadow Kirby again. Apparently taking part in this game's battles as part of some weird prank on Kirby, it's good confirmation <laughs> that the mirror world is still safe. After that, good, I good, guess good, the masks good. DDD and Meta Knight used to power up could have importance down the line, but there's nothing that points to that right now. So with all that taken care of, let's get into the real meat of the Ooh, video. Forgotten when it land. comes to the lore of Kirby and the Forgotten Land, a lot has changed from how the previous entries handled lore. And I'm not just talking about how lore is now contained in gotcha figures either. Like how Star Allies heavily implied that Kirby and Void are two sides of the same coin, one being born of positive energy and the other of negative energy, Forgotten Land comes in with even more implications like that. There's some hard facts here and there, don't misunderstand me, it's just the sheer amount of implications here outweigh them by a lot. For example, the fact that this game takes place in an alternate dimension to that of Kirby's universe. It's mm. never explicitly said, but seeing how at multiple points it's shown that time there runs significantly Kirby faster than that game, of Kirby's bro. dimension, it's the most reasonable explanation considering everything else we learn. As even with Kirby getting sucked in around the same time as everyone else, he clearly arrived much later than them all due to him struggling against the portals for a few extra pop star seconds. Or the fact that despite Elphalyn coming back to Kirby near immediately after disappearing, appearing at the end, later he says that Claroline had to nurse him back to health after he separated the two worlds. Meaning from the perspective of anyone left on Popstar, Kirby was probably gone for barely any time at all. In turn, while I'll do my best to make everything as concise as possible, this means I will have to delve a bit more into theory territory than normal, as there's really no way to avoid it. Luckily, many of said theories do have substantial evidence like that whole alternate Dude, dimension business. Me. Though before that, let's start with the things we know for sure. If if you notice any differences from what you saw in the game, that's because I'm referring to direct translations of the Japanese text, not what we got in the localized game, since sadly, like those mentioned before, bits and pieces were lost in translation. Long mm. before portals opened up okay, above Popstar okay, okay. and sucked its inhabitants into the Forgotten Land, there was a civilization much like our own. At the time, its inhabitants were struggling with the ever-looming crisis of overpopulation, their world becoming too small for their civilization. Then, out of nowhere, came the ultimate life form of Fecto Elphilus, what an all-powerful alien creature that's made its sole purpose to violently conquer world after world. However, against the odds, the people of that world managed to put a stop to Elphilus's invasion by capturing the alien. With the crisis fuck? averted, they then begin to study its powers in Lab Discovera, turning its fantastical abilities into technology beyond their wildest dreams. Most importantly, replicating the method they used to get there in the first place by recreating its ability to warp anywhere, whether it be from one location to the other or even to another dimension entirely. Although, while experimenting with Dang. said warp technology, Fecto Elphilus would be split into two creatures, one holding the small amount of compassion buried within them, and the other holding their invasive malicious tendencies. Once split, the newly created Elphalyn would escape Lab Discoverer altogether, never to be found by the civilization again. And as if Elphalus wasn't in a bad situation before, now that they're fractured, the eternal capsule that served as its prison had become its life support. Because in this larval state, they physically can't survive outside the capsule without copious amounts of energy. Thus, once they'd used up their invader 
together completely and became a highly advanced technological civilization, the solution to their woes had become perfectly clear. Use their newfound warp technology to leave their cramped planet Bro, behind got... altogether. Their destination had been pretty obvious if you've noticed certain parallels to other aspects of Kirby War, which bro. brings us to the crazy. next round of this major implications. A bit more clear-cut compared to later ones, in Possessed Leongar's pre-fight speech, there's one line in particular that brings with it one of the biggest revelations in Kirby so far. As when he says that the Forgotten Land's inhabitants left for a land of dreams, just what other location does that sound like? That's right, the very place Kirby calls home, Dreamland. Now, to be fair, this could also mean Kirby's universe at large and not specifically Dreamland, but there's definitely evidence that these people were here at some point. Because after abandoning both their planet and dimension, this civilization would go on to become the enigmatic ancients we've come to know all too well from many years worth of lore. More specifically, the scientific ancients, as the magical ones were probably already in this universe when they arrived. Need more proof? Just look at all the technology associated with the scientific ancients. Many probably made with the magical ancients during their period of friendship, there's the lore Starcutter for one, which specializes in interdimensional travel. Ships like it most likely serve to take the scientific ancients to Kirby's dimension in the first place. Really and who can forget the Clockwork Stars? Alongside it galaxies. being shown that many of the wishes they grant involve the use of opening portals to other worlds or dimensions, don't their cores look like a certain someone? It oh may just be me. Wait, 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 wait. ...to other worlds or dimensions, and don't their cores look like a certain someone? It may just be me, but the shape of Fecto Fargo's Bro. head in that capsule looks a bit too similar to the cores of Clockwork Stars to be a coincidence. This means that with this major reveal of the scientific ancient's origins, we now know how Kandra wasn't their homeworld. It was one of possibly many places they called home after leaving their original dimension. Alongside how Kandra, even Shiverstar could have been the their home for some time. Point, the abandoned Bro. civilization on that planet does bear many striking similarities to what we've seen in Forgotten Land. However, as the world could just be the Kirby Dimensions version of the Ancients' old home, there's an equal chance its inhabitants were entirely separate. It'd be pretty funny if they recreated their original planet only to screw it up all over again. But I'll stop there to refrain from sprinkling in too many crazy headcanons. Back in the Forgotten Holy Lands dimension, Fecto Forgo remained confined for eons. So long, in fact, that the fauna left behind on the world would eventually evolve to a point of intelligence. Using this to their advantage, Fecto Forgo would slowly but surely spread its will over the planet from within their psychic dream dimension. While gradually gaining influence over all life on the planet, they'd managed to directly take control of a prominent animal named Leon when he discovered Fecto Forgo. Then, using Leon's famous status among the peaceful animals of the world to rally them under the plots of Forgo, Leon would become Leongar and the Beast Pack was formed. Through Leongar, this is when the Beast Pack would begin searching the planet all over for Elphalin, along with gathering food and the recently transported residents like of Popstar to provide the energy Fecto Forgo needed to exist outside the capsule. Which finally is where the events of Kirby and the Forgotten Land actually start. This Since while well, Fecto amazing. Forgo still had the power to open up portals between dimensions, the fractured state significantly destabilized the power, leading to portals seemingly opening up at random like they did in the beginning of the game. In the mere moments that Kirby struggled against the pull of the portals, Elphalin and the Waddledees would establish their village far away from the Beast Pack's usual operations, Meta Knight would take to defending them, all the while resisting Forgo's influence, and DDD would… well, fail at resisting to say the least. Seriously, this has to be the most extensive backstory to the events of a Kirby game yet. Don't worry, there's still more to cover. Jumping ahead to after Fecto Elphalus' initial defeat at the hands of Kirby and Elphalin, merely destroying the ultimate lifeform's corporeal body wasn't enough to fully defeat it. Now existing solely as an incorporeal entity sustained by their own incredible psychic powers, Forgo retreated to their dream dimension. There, they'd begin to once again plan their return, despite being in an even weaker state than before. The only real advantage to be had being the fact that they could use a Leon's body as their own. So getting rid of Leon's soul and smashing it to pieces for good measure, Forgo began began to create an army of stronger doppelgangers from the residual psychic energy left over from Forgo influencing the entire planet, which sets the stage for the real important thing coming up. Where all the backstory surrounding the Ancients and Elphilus was pretty significant, equally so is the second appearance of Morpho Knight. Unlike its introduction in the What oh, wow, If mode of Star back? Allies, this marks its first appearance in the canon timeline. Now okay. this is incredibly monumental for several reasons. Not only is this the first time ever that a fight originating in Kirby's What If scenarios 
has made the transition over to being 100% canon, it also raises even more questions about Morpho Knight itself. For one, while Hal was definitely alluding Hold to up. Morpho Knight eventually crossing super, over into the canon spooky. universe before, I did not expect it to happen so soon. It's still an incredibly mysterious entity, but we do still learn some interesting details. Namely, its appearance right before Fecto Forgo's soul was about to fight Kirby reinforces Morpho Knight's nature of reaping all-powerful characters that have lived unnaturally long. As much like that Galactonite butterfly. before it, Fecto Forgo has that also butterfly. been trapped for an unimaginable amount of time, only surviving due to its sheer power. But it could also be as simple as Morpho Knight absorbing him solely due to his power like the Gotcha lore states. When it comes to Morpho Knight this time, it's actually what happens after you fight him that brings in a lot of very important illusions. Like how when you beat him, rather than only dissipating back into butterflies, Fecto Forgo manages to escape. And before we get to all of what comes next, this confirms a pretty massive detail. You see, when Morpho Knight was first defeated in Star Allies, there was no such animation for Galacta okay, Knight okay, escaping, okay. which leads me to believe that all this time, Morpho Knight still holds Galacta Knight within them. In a weird roundabout way, this means Galacta Knights entered the canon universe too. Now this is That's stepping clean. a bit into theory I territory guess, here, but I, all I the signs point to this. Enough, After all, but, eh. with it being shown that Morpho Knight still has many of Galacta Knight's attacks, this makes it incredibly likely that the supposed strongest warrior in the galaxy could be inches away from making his first canon appearance. Ooh. We'll just have to see what awaits us with what's sure to be plenty of future Morpho Knight fights. I I On a side fight. note, I, I do fight. wonder I if, like fight. Morpho Knight, there's only one Galacta Knight that can be summoned from across dimensions. Because if that isn't the case, there could now be two Galacta Knights in Kirby, the one absorbed by Morpho Knight and the as-of-yet-unseen one in the canon universe. But mm, that's a headache okay. for another okay, day. Okay, okay. Going back to Fecto Elphilus's last okay. shot at revenge, we're met with this game's soul boss equivalent, Chaos Whoa, 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 whoa. This design. I need to finish I need to finish this game because I I never got to this part honestly. Elphilus. Having pulled the reverse Morpho Knight and taken some energy from it for a change, okay. the simple fact that it's now called Chaos Elphilus hints at Morpho Knight's very origin. Again, stepping a bit back into crackpot theories here, remember all that stuff about Chaos from earlier? Alongside its components consisting of things that are all pretty important in Kirby, it's said to be the very origin of Void itself. Well, considering that Chaos Elphilus oh. only received the Chaos part of its name after taking some dash, of Morpho Knight's dash. power, that leads me to believe that Morpho Knight is either linked or straight up comes from this mysterious all-encompassing force. Like many soul bosses, Chaos Elphilus makes use of various attacks we've seen chaos. past soul okay, fights okay. utilize. For a long time, I always thought it was just some fan service on Hal's part, nothing more. However, seeing that it only received set attacks after taking on the power of Chaos, that leads me to believe that every soul fight until now has had some sort of connection to Chaos. After all, one of the things stated- These bro, I'm telling you, the references are so of touch, bro. To make up chaos in the first chaos place is soul. Again? As it stands, we don't have enough puzzle pieces here to fully predict what this entails, but I'm certain that this is building up to something unbelievably immense. So after putting Elphilus's eons of struggling to an end, Kirby's power of miracles allowed the entity one last chance at rebirth. Thus, with Elphilus willingly rejoining with Elphilin to become whole for good, that just about wraps up all the new lore there ending. is. Beautiful ending. Beautiful as minor ending. as it is, during the final battle, Elphilus does share one attack with another boss before the whole chaos thing happens. Just like Void Terminus' third phase, oh, he also was, dives I toward you, dragging a mind. weapon across the ground. Not to mention, in Elphilus' theme, there's a portion that features a very similar organ progression to that of Void Terminus' third phase, too. You could easily chalk the two up to coincidence, but I felt it was at least worth mentioning here okay, at the okay. end. It is interesting how, in spite of how much of the Forgotten Land is shown, we never get a glimpse of what the scientific ancients might have looked like. Me, Taking guess. context clues and the cardboard cutout in Wandaria into consideration, I think it's safe to say they were humans or something resembling them at least. Adeline's got some splaining to do. So there you have it, another video of me incessantly rambling about Kirby lore. Just about finished that strawberry shortcake from last time, so how about a Kirby burger? Nice! Freaking lore video. I love this video, bro. Make sure y'all like, comment, subscribe, y'all want me to react to some more, more lore because Lord Kirby is one of the best things I've ever seen. And I hope y'all like, comment, subscribe, because, hey, this was amazing. This was amazing. Peace.